Hello everyone. In this video, I will be talking on chronic rhinosinusitis. So we have seen in our previous video on acute rhinosinusitis that how they clinically present. And many times the clinical presentation of acute sinusitis and chronic sinusitis are almost similar. And many authors consider only the duration of the disease as a criteria to differentiate between the acute and chronic rhinosinusitis. So let's see the chronic rhinosinusitis. So it is a group of disorder that is characterized by inflammation of mucosa of the nose and paranasal sinuses of at least 12 consecutive week duration and it is characterized by chronic inflammation of the nasal mucosa, cytokines release and as it is a long standing process so it leads to tissue remodeling. And unlike the acute rhinosinusitis which is widely considered infectious disorder, in chronic rhinosinusitis the mechanism is less clear and we will see in subsequent slides that there are many factors that are responsible for chronic rhinosinusitis, but still not a single factor is clearly associated with the mechanism of chronic rhinosinusitis. So, individual factors roles in chronic rhinosinusitis varies in importance in individual patients. And as we know that chronic rhinosinusitis is a chronic inflammatory process that having a baseline inflammatory inflammatory activity but many times they may have acute exacerbation and it has been seen that these acute exacerbations are mostly due to infection but not in all cases. So they may have intermittent flare-up and these intermittent flare-up of chronic rhinosinusitis are labeled as acute exacerbation of chronic rhinosinusitis. So coming to the phenotypical classification of chronic rhinosinusitis. This classification is done on clinical evaluation and that is done during the nasal endoscopic examination and it is based on the presence and absence of polyp during nasal endoscopy. So one category, the chronic rhinosinusitis is associated with polyposis that is called the CRS WNP and another category are the chronic rhinosinusitis without polyposis and it has been seen that the chronic rhinosinusitis that is associated with polyposis, the etiology are in the most of the cases unclear, but there is possible association with the atopy like allergic rhinitis and they have the, some overlapping features with the allergic rhinitis and they are characterized by snophilic inflammation. But on the opposite hand, those who are not having polyposis, they have persistent inflammation result from, result from incomplete resolution of the acute infection. So here, this is that no dissolution of acute infection can lead to non polyposis chronic rhinosinusitis, but with polyposis, the mostly atopic. And without poly polyposis, it is characterized by neutrophilic inflammation, unlike the previous one, which is characterized by snophilic inflammation. So, let's see the pathophysiology. It is quite complex without any clear cut mechanism how it happens. So, there will be inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinus that may result from varieties of causes that leads to sinus osteal obstruction. And this sinus osteal obstruction ultimately leads to further infection and the development of inflammation. So, key to chronic rhinosinusitis is inflammation and any mechanism that induces inflammation of the nose and penis can lead to chronic rhinosinusitis. And we already and as we already discussed, the etiology of chronic rhinosinusitis is less clear. In majority of the cases, they are idiopathic, the actual cause is not known and only a few number of the cases, they are very limited in number where the actual cause has been suggested. These are like genetics causes like Cartagena syndrome in cystic fibrosis and some of the autoimmune diseases are associated with chronic rhinosinusitis and actually these are the nasal manifestation of the systemic autoimmune disease like sarcoidosis, Wegener granulomatosis, systemic lupus erythematosus and some cases of systemic immune deficiency 
like HIV infection. So if you see the factors that those are associated with chronic rhinosinusitis, they are varied. It is subclassified into the host factor and environmental factor. In the host factor, they are further classified as local, which includes anatomical factors of the nose or paranasal sinuses, neoplastic obstruction of the nose or acquired mucociliary dysfunction. In the systemic or allergic, genetic, systemic mucociliary dysfunction from endocrine diseases and neuromuscular disorders. In the environmental causes, these are the trauma to the nose and paranasal sinuses, then the medications we have seen later on, then the infection play a significant role in chronic rhinosinusitis and the surgery. Many of the cases of chronic rhinosinusitis may be the effect of the some nasal surgery. Then the chemical, then the pollutant, then the smoke, especially the tobacco smoke, and the cases of hydrogenic sinusitis. So if we see the pathogenesis of the chronic rhinosinusitis, we have the factors. These are categorized as the host factors, then environmental factors. And these host factors and environmental factors, they interact with each other at some interface. And this dysfunction of the interface or the dysfunctional interaction at the site of interface between the host factor and environmental factors leads to chronic inflammation of the nose and paranasal sinus. And this interface area is the sinonasal mucosa. So we know that we have the sinonasal mucosa and this is the interface where the host factor interact with the environmental factor. And normally what happens, we have a very good immune response to the environmental factors. But if there is some imbalance or dis dysfunctional interaction between the host and environmental factors, it will lead to chronic inflammation of mucosa of nose and paranasal sinuses. So if we see the environmental factor as we discussed, it may be bacterial, infectious, pollutant or many things. So, but they have suggested that fungi having the special role in chronic rhinosinusitis and especially the airborne fungi. Then the bacteria like the Staphylococcus aureus, Tridomenus aeruginosa, Morex elacateralis and Mammophilus influenza. Then they also seen that the role of biofilms in the chronic rhinosinusitis and the existence of biofilms prevent the complete eradication of the pathological bacteria and that may lead to chronic rhinosinusitis. And there are something called super antigens that is mostly related to the step group of the bacteria. Then comes the virus. We already discussed the toxin and allergens. Anatomic, we have seen the obstruction of osteometal complex that ultimately leads to pent up of the secretion in the sinuses that will get infected and leads to inflammation. Then mechanical barriers like genetic defect of mucociliary flow or mucociliary dysfunctions, then defect in innate immunity or adaptive immunity, autoimmune diseases can cause chronic rhinosinusitis. Then the role of tissue modeling, especially the, if the process remain there for the longer period of time, if inflammation is there for the longer period of the time, that will lead to fibrosis, epithelial alteration, goblet cells hyperplasia, then subepithelial edema, then there will be inflammatory cell infiltrate along with basement membrane thickening. And all these things can ultimately facilitate the progression of the chronic rhinosinusitis. Along with this, if the disease is remain there for the long time, that there can be remodeling of the underlying bone. So this is in nutshell about the pathogenesis and we see these things to happen or the chronic inflammations to happen. We need a interface where there is a dysfunctional interaction between the environmental and host factor and this interface is the sinonasal mucosa. So we have seen the pathogenesis the role of the different factors. So on the basis of that, many theories are there for the chronic rhinosinusitis. And these theories are not 
true for all the cases. In some cases, some theories may be applicable, but it is universal, not applicable to each and every cases of the chronic rhinosinusitis. So we have to understand that each cases vary in their own pathogenesis. Theories are the fungal hypothesis, that is excessive response of host to the airborne fungi. Then again, the next one is leukotriene hypothesis. There is excessive pro-inflammatory leukotriene synthesis and there is a decrease in anti-inflammatory prostaglandin synthesis. So, a patient having chronic rhinosinusitis, it has been seen that there is excessive secretion of pro-inflammatory leukotriene in comparison to anti-inflammatory prostaglandin. Then again, the staphylococcal superantigen hypothesis is there. Then the immune barrier hypothesis where there is a defect of mechanical barrier or the immune innate immunity. Then the role of biofilms in the biofilm hypothesis that prevent the complete eradication of the infection. And there is a chronic infection that leads to chronic rhinosinusitis. So, if you see the sign and symptoms of chronic rhinosinusitis, it is very similar to the acute rhinosinusitis except the duration. So, we know the duration is the 12 week. So, persistent of the sign and symptoms, most of the sign and symptoms of the acute renal sinusitis that continue for more than 12 weeks, then we will label it as chronic rhinosinusitis. So, again, like the same like the acute rhinosinusitis, the sign and symptoms are classified as major or minor. So, major symptoms or signs are facial pain or pressure, facial congestion or fullness, nasal blockage, purulent nasal discharge, it may be anterior discharge or the posterior discharge, hyposmia or anosmia, then purulence on nasal examination. And remember one thing, unlike acute rhinosinusitis, the fever is not included in the major sign and symptom. So, the fever is not there in chronic rhinosinusitis as a major symptom, but it is included in minor group. And the things that fall in minor symptoms and signs are headache, fever, halitosis, fatigue, dental pain, cough, earache or ear fullness. So, we know the sign and symptoms of the chronic rhinosinusitis and against the pathogenesis. Based on all these things, the diagnostic criteria or guidelines has been formulated and as per the clinical practice guidelines for the adult sinusitis, the diagnostic criteria are like this. That includes more than 12 weeks of sign and symptoms of two or more of the following sign and symptoms. And these sign and symptoms include mucoprolan discharge that may be anterior, posterior or both, nasal obstruction that is congestion, facial pain, pressure or fullness, and decreased sense of smell and inflammation as it is documented by one of or more of the following findings like prolate mucus or edema in the middle meatus or ethmoid region, polyp in the nasal cavity or the middle meatus, or radiographic image is showing inflammation of paranasal sinus. So the inflammation have to be demonstrated or documented by one or more of the following findings. So we know the diagnostic criteria, sign and symptoms. So how we will evaluate a case of chronic rhinosinusitis? So the history is very important. Then in the history, the duration is the most important thing we have to take into the consideration because this is the duration only that decide whether the patient is having acute rhinosinusitis or chronic rhinosinusitis, then the symptoms like fever, nasal obstruction, nasal discharge, defect of smell. Then the history suggestive of complication. It is also important because the many cases of chronic rhinosinusitis may be the very first time present with the complication. Then once we have the history during the clinical examination, nasal endoscopic the most important examination and the based of nasal endoscopic findings, we divide the chronic rhinosinusitis into two groups with polyp or without polyp. In the nasal endoscopy, other things we will see is the prolent mucus, 
edema of the turbinates and of course the nasal polyp we have to see only for the division of the chronic rhinosinusitis then the radiological investigation many times x-ray of the pns is sufficient but to categorize the disease or to know the extent of the disease and to plan the surgery many times we have to do the ct pns and in the ct pns what we see are the mucosal inflammation and also the anatomical obstruction or any mass that may be associated with the chronic rhinosinusitis or the mass may itself present as chronic rhinosinusitis mri it is indicated if patients may have the complication especially intracranial complications like meningitis cerebral abscess then you may have to think to do mri then of course the microbiology play important role in the evaluation and to do are the culture and sensitivity as indicated then the other test as per indication suppose if you suspect the patient having the allergic manifestation then you have to do the allergic study and other immunological study as per the indication suppose a patient having connective tissue disorder then you have to consider for immunological study also so this is the endoscopic finding of chronic rhinosinusitis in one picture we can see here there is a discharge in the middle meatus so this nasal discharge in the middle meatus may be the one of the feature of the chronic rhinosinusitis here we haven't seen any polyp but in other picture you can see here there is a nasal polyp in case of chronic rhinosinusitis so on the basis of the nasal endoscopy we divide the chronic rhinosinusitis into with polyp and without polyp then some findings of chronic rhinosinusitis are the opacification of the sinuses and thickening and sclerosis of the sinus wall and here we can see there is a total opacification of the moist sinuses so the features of the chronic sinusitis are the mucosal thickening and, or there may be some remodeling of the bone also then coming to the treatment the treatment is complex why it is complex the reason is that it has a variable etiology and it is difficult to distinguish them clinically so clinically it is very difficult to identify or specify the specific etiology in individual cases that's why the treatment is very complex and also the treatment varies across the geographic region and also across the physician specialty so it very much depends upon the expertization and the facilities that is available and if we see the treatment the main stay of the treatment includes intranasal steroid nasal lavas antibiotics and other additional treatment like antihistaminic leukotriene inhibitor nasal decongestant or antifungal when indicated for the purpose of treatment the chronic rhinosinusitis are divided into three group chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyp with polyp and allergic fungal rhinosinusitis this allergic fungal rhinosinusitis will not discuss in this video as it is already discussed in our previous video on fungal infection of nose and paranasal sinus so if we see the treatment of chronic rhinosinusitis nasal polyp they are classified as mild case or moderate to severe case in the mild case the things given are intranasal steroid then the nasal lavas and if the failure after 3 month then it should be treated like moderate or severe cases and we have to consider for ct pns and also to consider for the surgery and moderate to severe cases the treatment is intranasal steroid others are the nasal lavas and long term meprolides therapy can be considered for the moderate to severe cases along with the antibiotic as may be started as empiricals and later on we can modify as per the culture report so if any failure is there in these cases then you have to think of the complication and you have to consider for the ct and you have, may have to plan for the surgery in cases of chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyp in the mild cases intranasal steroid is indicated that can be converted into oral steroid if there is not sufficient 
response is there with the internal steroid and if there is a failure then you have to consider for the CT and you may have to consider for the surgery. In moderate cases we can give intranasal steroid for three months. If failure, then we can start oral steroid for short course, then consider for the surgery. And in severe cases, short course oral steroid plus intranasal steroid for one month. Once improvement, consider for the surgery. And if there is a failure or there is any complication, consider directly CT scan, and then the surgery. So, what are the complications of the chronic rhinosinusitis? It occurs when the inflammation and infection is spread outside the PNS or the nasal cavity. It can be neurological like meningitis, epidural abscess, cerebral abscess, ophthalmic. Ophthalmic because the bone, lamina papyracea, is a very thin bones that divide the orbit from the paranasal sinuses. And this infection or inflammation can easily spread from the paranasal sinuses to orbit. And it can lead to orbital cellulitis that in severe cases it can result in orbital abscess and that may also lead to cavernous sinus thrombosis. This local inflammation and infection may, so may it spread to other part of the body and then can cause systemic complications like sepsis and other things. Then the other complications are ostitis, sinocutaneous fistula. So here we will see the only the name of the surgery. We will not, we are not going to discuss in detail about the surgery that are done in chronic rhinosinusitis. So nowadays, open sinus surgeries have given the way to the endoscopic sinus surgery, and endoscopic sinus surgery are nowadays the preferred method of doing surgery for chronic rhinosinusitis. And the type of the surgery is very much depends upon the extent of the disease. And the part of the nose and paranasal sinus involved. And the commonly done surgeries are maxillary entrostomy, partial and complete ethmoidectomy, sphenoidotomy, and frontal sinusotomy. With this, I came to the end of this video. Thank you for watching this video.